Hey, Caitlin, we are back again. We're back again. I keep saying like a like bad it's... dream, but no, no it's, it's like a fever a dream. dream. I don't know. It's not a bad dream. Isn't that a Taylor Swift song? Something about a, a nightmare dressed like a daydream? Nightmare right? dressed like a daydream? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm um, listening. I'm paying attention. It's a blank space, I think. Darling, yep. I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream. Dress like a daydream. Mm-hmm. And uh, for Halloween that year... She was a pegacorn, and the caption on the, her Instagram post was, "Darling, I'm a nightmare dressed like a pegacorn." Okay, There's a little a pegacorn. So Pegasus unicorn you. hybrid, like the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the mashup uh, child of two mythical horsey beings. Um, mm-hmm. okay. cool, yeah, cool. definitely. Oh, well, it feels uh, like it's been also forever. been watching. Well, we've been watching a lot of Hercules at my house, so uh, we've gotten oh. to know Pegasus well. Yeah. And I assume the I mean, we watched uh, it. Yeah. the Disney cartoon. It's not me. Yeah, yes. Like okay. the 1997 like... Yeah, Danny DeVito. The Can you believe that? Oh, wow. The 80s TV show, like live action. I th- I'm pretty sure that mm. was one. Oh, gosh. Um... No. Kevin Sorbo? <laughs> Let's not get into Kevin Sorbo today. Let's we'll not let... do that. We'll Mm-mm. just let him Mm-mm. do his thing somewhere outside of our realm. Um, So interesting, I think um, she'll need to be a little bit older, but uh, there are also Pegasi in Percy Jackson. Um, Oh, yeah. Which were mediocre, um, but also in uh, the new TV show, which is actually really, really good. Okay. And the kid who um... played... um, Oh. I was just going to share a movie fact, but the kid yeah, who played please. Ryan, the young Ryan Reynolds in that, oh gosh, what was the movie called now? Oh, I can't remember. Yep. Yeah, but I the one where he goes about. back in time and there's this little kid who is like, could probably pay, play a junior Deadpool, like dead ringer for Ryan Reynolds' attitude and personality. He's Percy Jackson in the series. Oh, okay. Okay. And less yeah, snarky think, and less sweary. Um... I will have a hard time, like, I want to, we want to be the, I want to be the house where, like, everybody gathers, right, where all of her Mm -hmm. little friends come and they feel safe and, you know, I have all the treats and just, like, help yourself, whatever, but I also am concerned because I think I'm going to struggle with, like, age-appropriate content, like, the other day she told me, um, we don't say shit at daycare or she said she said shit and i was like why are you saying that and she goes well that daddy's truck is broken we say shit when daddy's truck is broken and just like enunciated every single syllable and Mm -hmm. i was like this is so funny it was so funny but then i was also like this is not this is not good parenting but then i was also like I don't know how to tell, like, it's not a bit, I don't know. I say shit. I can't very well tell you not to say it. it I don't know. There's so many ways to screw up your kids is the point that mm-hmm. I'm trying to make. Oh yeah. And so I just oh, said, yeah. we don't say that at daycare. We don't say shit at daycare that we can say that at our house. And so then I'm looking forward to the day where she tells a stranger, we don't say shit at daycare. We only say shit at my house. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Um, Mother of the year here. I'm looking forward to the day when she's in uh, school and you get the call from the principal's office that your daughter is swearing like a sailor in class appropriately. And so she gets points. For oh, that. yeah. However, That's the thing. She she, gramma- she grammatically can process. She told me the other day she used the word well correctly, where she was like, oh, th- this is going well. And I was like, oh, oh my God, instead of you're good. a little genius. Yay. Instead of good, yeah. Which is, yeah, it was perfect. So um, she will absolutely be using the correct tenses of swears. But okay. maybe well, I mean, not at a could... time when other children <laughs> should be hearing well, them. I mean, content-wise, though, it's not like you're pulling out like nine and a half weeks or an officer and a gentleman or anything for the kids. Like, no. You know. No, I don't think so, I think an officer and a gentleman is pretty tame now. By probably like now, like for, by, by like 2024 standards. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, isn't watched... it just like one flash of Richard Gere's butt and then that's it? I think so. Yeah, we started watching <laughs> Fallout, which is phenomenal, um, whether you played the game or not. 
But I was mm-hmm. chatting with a friend and I was like, oh, you didn't tell me there was man ass at 19 minutes in. So, yeah, we get a lot more that of is... that, especially with the streamers, right? Because it's Because, yeah, regulated. there's the, the FTC guidelines don't apply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why you should do uh, CTV, which we talked about a couple episodes ago, I think. Yeah. Um, but that's not today's topic. Today, we are here to talk about email We're talking marketing. about rum. We are talking about rum also, but yes, we'll get to your cocktail in a moment. Uh, I know you, uh, <laughs> actually gin is your jam, but rum, your husband cannot pass up a rum drink, as he so eloquently said at our post-holiday party uh, at, is it La Colona? Oh is that right? Or I always La Colona. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about email marketing performance and it's interesting because this is not something that's necessarily my forte. So I'll probably shut up for most of the episode. Uh, maybe not. We'll see. Um, I mean, I understand marketing email and I understand metrics. Um, but like, if you give me those and you're like, I have like three tricks to like get better open rates or get better click through rates. Mm -hmm. And all of them are like, rewrite your subject line, which is legit. Like that's a legit thing. Um, change up your content right. if no one's clicking, change your call to action. But there's like so much more than that. Um, and so we've got Charlotte here who um, has worked in this space and has helped people uh, with this and is here to help our clients, of course, but also anybody listening. Um, mm-hmm. So that'll be exciting for me. We'll have all of those things to talk about. So if you do uh, marketing emails, uh, definitely this is one you don't want to miss. Um, if you don't, it's still going to be interesting. So please don't like tune out. We don't want Zach. To Charlotte get taught me some stuff. Off. Yeah. On a call last week with a client where they were asking me questions about email and I was like, you know what? I don't know. And it was the first time that she had shadowed like one of my actual onboarding as opposed to like just a kickoff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she was like, may I? And I'm like, please, for the love, teach me. <laughs> And I think I remember, I don't know if it was this client, but I know that there have been times when somebody's like, we just switched email systems and sent out 100,000 emails right out of the gate. And it's like, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. Like, you should send them in smaller batches. Like, you don't have to send them in, like, 10 at a time, but, like, even 1,000 at a time for the first or 5,000, like, not 100,000. That's going to go terribly for you, and it's going to set up all kinds of red flags with Google and everybody if you're relaying through another system. Suddenly, you've got to kind of ease into that. Yeah. Um, also, make sure all Speaking your, all of your stuff easing is in, set up. We should ease into ease that. into the rum runner. <laughs> I like to dive right into a rum runner. So uh, I... what's going on with this cocktail? Well, it... Um... I think this is like most tiki lore is like, it's very kitschy and like 50s, 60s, 70s. But this one was uh, invented in the early 1970s where um, a bar manager was just like cleaning stuff out, which I can appreciate. I love a declutter. Uh, So he improvised this and ended up um, with, a recipe that is actually now an ounce of light rum, an ounce of navy strength rum, which would be like your overproof rum. Um, OFT oh, is really good like as an overproof or times, like a black strap. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times they'll do that as a floater, right? To give you a little bit of like, wow. Yeah. Sometimes kind of there's one. Um, let me finish this and then I can go on several rum tangents. Okay. But okay. Uh, one ounce of light rum, one ounce of overproof rum, one ounce of banana liqueur half ounce of blackberry liqueur um that's like creme de mure uh jessica and i just had cocktails with creme de mure in them last week uh so good Mm. uh two ounces of pineapple juice which is dorothy's uh cocktail of choice when we go to our local establishment one ounce of lime juice freshly squeezed as always half ounce of grenadine and then you granite garnish garnish with a brandy (laughs) cherry and a pineapple wedge so the coffee is not coffee Lime yeah. juice, fresh squeezed, pineapple juice, completely okay to use canned, right? Yes. Yeah. We actually that, keep, we stock canned pineapple juice. Um, I it's think hard because to squeeze ju- a pineapple. Like, juicing a pineapple would be quite cumbersome. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, we do have a corer that mm-hmm. takes out the core, but then also it's like, you know, when you get the can of pineapple, that's just like the, and it it's like mm-hmm. the middle is missing and it's in a circle the in a can. 
pineapple rings. Yes, thank you. Those are called. That's that's what I said, right? Uh, but there is a little. There's a tool that will let you like take out all of that, and then you're left mm-hmm. with the shell of the pineapple. You freeze them and turn them into glasses. So. Oh, like cups, yeah, yeah, yeah. not glasses. Like yeah, like. cups. Okay. <laughs> um, there's also one that will slice the pineapple spirally as you go down, like a ham. That's what this um, one does. So it like spiralizes okay. the actual fruit, takes out the core, and then leaves you with just the shell, like the the outside of the pineapple. Anyway, so um, I suppose though, when you're doing a, that, if you did it in a not large <laughs> yeah. bowl, all that juice would be captured at some point, and you could even squeeze some like out of that core or whatever. So maybe. The core is really is really um, tough. They're like they're very like uh, fibrous. That's the word I'm. All right, people, for. find a nice um, fresh pineapple juice in a can or a jar. That's going to be the way to go. All right, Dole so do will do this? you just fine. Uh, you fill a cocktail shaker two thirds full with ice. Add the gin, lime juice, and simple syrup. To um, that, there's no simple syrup in this recipe. Interesting. Oh, the grenadine maybe. Uh, Gin, lime juice, yes, that makes sense. Uh, grenadine, shake uh, thoroughly, and then, um, yeah, there you go. The end. Okay, and this one can go in a coupe glass, which is great. So I could double this and put it um, in our new oversized I, coupe glass. See, glasses. that's the thing. I would. I don't know if I'd put this in a coupe glass. I would honestly put this in a hurricane glass because you want to fill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to fill your fill your glass with pebble ice if you want to get really mm-hmm. schmancy. Part of um, part of like tiki cocktails, especially, is they need the dilution from the ice and the shaking, and Got so uh, they're meant to be sipped and diluted a little bit. That's that's why a lot of times they use that overproof rum. All right. Well, we'll um, we'll make sure Zach notifies the folks at liquor dot com where this particular recipe came from that they need to uh, change that. It up. shouldn't go in a coupe glass. Ugh. Can you? I mean, imagine? I love a coupe glass, you. but I think you're right. I actually got in trouble for making margaritas and not using the nugget ice that we had because apparently we bought nugget ice at some point last weekend and it was in the freezer and I was using the mm. the cocktail balls. And I was told, like, why are you not just using the nugget ice? And I was like, oh, we have nugget ice? Okay, well, I'll go get that. So I had the cocktail ball, and I made one with nugget ice for Brian, which was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I I feel like we could dedicate an entire intro to just the times that I have been on um, tiki, tiki, like, voyages. Tyrell just came could. back from a tiki bar in Vegas and brought a cute little maybe cute little Tyrell mug back. Should be a guest, and we can talk about like his favorite U.S. tiki bars. I don't know how we a tie lot, that into the topic. How much time do we have? I think we could use a whole episode. Can't. We'll just make that one cocktails. Could do like bi- yeah, business operations. That's his specialty. Okay, <laughs> customer satisfaction. About that. Yeah. Honestly, like customer delight is a good one. Maybe we you, you'll need to float that by him. Uh, maybe give him a couple rum runners before you ask, and we should be good. He's, yeah, yeah. All right, let's get into some email metrics. Between daycare swears and rum tangents, this has gone on long enough. Okay, we're back. No more pineapple tangents. Well, that's a sh- that's that. also a story for a different day. <laughs> okay, we'll talk pineapples and tiki bars later. But right now, Sharla is with <laughs> us, uh, who we have been at a tiki bar with, believe it or not. That's so, correct. Um, yeah, it was our post. That was a, that was a fun holiday. night. <laughs> it was. I am glad we checked out when we did because it seemed to get a little weirder after that. But. Yeah, I didn't stay for all the the weirdness. We we called it kind of an early night as well. (laughs) Yeah, I just, it's weird. I hit a point where I just didn't want to drink anymore and was like, well, I should just go home then. I know that's not how Summer Rich performed last year, but uh, that is how Winter or Spring Rich was. You better start training so you can get in summer shape. It's coming up. Yeah, I'm good with wine. I can drink almost as much wine as I want to, but when you start throwing in like... 
And I think with tiki bars, it's different, right? So like it'll be a rum drink, but you might get a tequila drink. You might get a gin drink. Like that's where I start to go south. Is... That overproof rum will get you. Mm-hmm. It will. But we're not here to talk rum. We're here to talk email marketing. So um, Charlotte, I think first of all, like how did you like get started doing email marketing? Like how was that a thing mm-hmm. that you know? Uh, that's a really um, not very interesting story, actually. Um, <laughs> I was working at Enterprise Rent-A-Car as an assistant branch manager um, for like two and a half years after I moved to Omaha and um, finally felt like I was ready to stop washing cars in high heels and um, running. I'm sorry, wait, you wash cars in high heels? Like I get that yes. at a car wash, like a college car wash thing, but... Yes, I was in suits and high heels. Just a stringent dress code? Yes. Yes, you had to be in business professional dress. Um, But you often had to wash cars yourself because you would be low staffed or the rest of your staff would be out um, picking up customers and dropping off cars and doing all the other things that go along with car rental business. And so you you did what you had to do to make your business work. Um, So yeah, And you left all that excitement for the world of email marketing? (laughs) Yeah, you know, it was um, it was a lot of long hours and very little reward, so it was time. Um, but then, uh, you know, just trying to find, I have a degree in marketing from Kansas State, so I was, uh, you know, just looking into any shape and form of marketing positions that were available in the area, and um, I found one with a company called Walter Carl, and... I uh, applied and interviewed, and that's the beginning of my foray into email marketing. I've been doing that for, I don't know, about 15, 15 years off and on here, so. Hmm. Well, cool. Um, so what, what do you think is the most important for people? Like, if they could only take one thing away, what do they need to know about email marketing? Like, what's kind of the golden rule? Is, is there a golden rule, I guess? Maybe that's the question. Um, yeah, I I mean, I could think of probably 20 golden rules, but, um, I think it's always being relevant to what your audience wants, you know, making sure that your subject line is relevant and eye-catching, making sure that your content is relevant and eye-catching, that it's information that they want to digest and it's not just a random filler that you put in to fill up your newsletter every week. Email for the sake of email is my least favorite. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you have nothing to say, don't say it. Be relevant. Exactly. (laughs) That's a good one. Um, So I guess just talk to us about some of the metrics. We're here to talk about email marketing performance, right? So obviously being relevant is going to help you get those opens and ideally get a click-through. Like I'm going to click-through on something I want more often than something I don't. I'm actually wishing that Amazon would send me an email about a backpack I looked at like six months ago after seeing a TV ad, believe it or not. Like complete like down the marketing rabbit hole. TV ad on streaming, really liked it, looked it up on their website, price was a little ridiculous, went to Amazon, exact same bag, not even a knockoff from the company, price was a little bit better, but I didn't buy it. I didn't pull the trigger and now I'm like, can I search Amazon for like bags I've looked at which you probably can but anyway if they send me that email I would buy it today yep I always put those in my cart and then when I decide I'm not buying them I put them in my saved for later so they're always sending me emails about anything that's in my saved for later yeah and I didn't do that my save for later is just jammed full of things from like three years ago that I'm still thinking I should buy that but I haven't Mm -hmm. um so (laughs) What? I that's know. how I know I'm ready to let something go is when I close the tab I deleted like, a couple nope. of them out of there the other day I was like I'm never going to buy these and one of them was like this item is no longer available sorry and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you waited too long <laughs> we won't be okay, emailing so, you about this <laughs> exactly walk us through kind of the most important metrics like those ones that everybody knows like um, you know open and click through and blah 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 Yeah, um, so like open rate, click-through rate, um, conversion rates, unsubscribe rates, uh, bounce rates are kind of the the bread and butter of email marketing. Um, There's a few others. Those are the ones that were most familiar, like as we were looking at the prep sheet. Um, 
So any of those you want to dive into and like share a little bit more on problems with it, things like that? Um, yeah, I think probably like first and foremost, uh, you know, kind of your first line is your open rate. Um, it's a pretty cru- crucial metric um, in email marketing. Um, obviously, if your content into your subject line are not relevant to your audience, they're not going to open it. Um, so a higher open rate typically indicates that your audience finds your emails engaging and relevant. Um and on the other side of that, if your open rate is low, it probably suggests that your subject lines are not compelling enough or they are misleading um, or they're just very blah and boring. Um, and maybe they're just getting buried in your inbox. They, maybe they're being sent at the wrong time so that it's not at the top of your inbox when you're looking at, you're checking your emails and um, you know they get buried. And by the time you have five, five, 10 emails in, you're kind of over reading all the subject lines and deciding what you want to look at. And so you just kind of mass delete everything. Yep. Yeah. Cause that's stuff that's like, Oh, it's been in there for 30 days. I don't need it anymore. Just delete. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I get, so... I, I'm a, a chronic subscriber though. And I subscribe to so many different things. Um, and so, yeah, I can check my email every day and have 150 emails. So <laughs> The ones that are at the top, um, they, you know, they get my attention. And the ones that are further down, mm-hmm. it's when I'm like, okay, I don't have time to be reading through all of this and just click and delete all of them. Yeah, I'll sort mine by brand sometimes. Like if I know I'm like waiting, like, oh, hey, we need more blinds. I'm going to go look at like, has Easy Blinds emailed me oh. recently with a 20% off discount? Um, but once when I do that, if I don't see what I want, I just highlight all of them from them and delete them all because there's nothing in there. That uh-huh. I wanted. Um, so what's an easy, what makes a good subject line? Like how does the subject line make people open? What do I need to do if I'm like writing a subject line? Um, well, it needs, like I said before, it needs to be relevant. Um, anything that's eye catching or attention catching, um, you know, uh, you know, not necessarily using all caps, but you need to, your subject line should be kind of maybe um, not necessarily, I mean, depending on your industry and what your your content is. I mean, witty, eye-catching, funny, anything that will catch their attention and, and maybe intrigue them enough to open the email to find out what's inside. Um, should I use emoji in my yeah. subject line? Um, yeah, emojis are getting a lot better it used to be when uh, we started using emojis and subject lines they wouldn't necessarily render on all platforms so it mm-hmm. just come across as like question marks or little squares um so yep. you're kind of like oh, I, I don't, I don't know what that means yeah <laughs> um, but now like most people open on the phone right and if any phone can handle emojis on the email uh, mm-hmm. yep. generator but yeah. they may look a little different android and iphone are not the same this is true. I do still see some of those weird characters in my subject lines in my inbox. Wild. I think it's just you have to make sure that you're choosing ones that are um, fairly mainstream and that, and that you know Universal. are going to be used across yep all all platforms. So not the um, I, every time Apple updates their software, <laughs> they throw in new emoji that may not be elsewhere. Like don't use those. Use the things that have been around. Like the laughing yes. while crying emoji is safe. Everybody's got yes, a hundred percent. I get a lot of sirens, uh-huh. or like the mm. red, like fireworky ones, where I'm like, ah, this is not an emergency. I understand yeah. that things are fifty percent off, but this is not an emergency. No. Or like the party <laughs> the ones, siren. like the little megaphone with the confetti. Mm-hmm. So be original. Do you wanna, with yeah, your I was like, do you want a tangent? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I feel like the siren Ta-da. is the new, like, you used to be able to put a red exclamation point on work emails if they were urgent, and uh-huh. then everybody started putting them on mm. every work email, and uh-huh. then I think it's just gone away. I don't even know as though you can do that anymore. Like, I feel that's like that's really where the red siren point. came in. Marking uh-huh. things as high yep. importance. Yep. I've seen it's an some outlook trick, I think. Two more recently that'll use like bold fonts. And it used to be able, you wouldn't be able to change the font mm-hmm. in your subject line. Um, and I like bold fonts or italics or, you know, something to set it apart. 
I like to write all my subject lines in Russian characters, but I spell English <laughs> words with Russian characters. I feel that works well. I prefer hieroglyphics. Um, I feel like that's a code. I mean, you can only send that to people that know what that means. <laughs> so I feel, Caitlin, like um, emoji are hieroglyphics, and we've just come back. Probably. Around. Yep, um, yeah. 100%. I mean, everything old is new again. <laughs> that would be a good challenge. Somebody has to write an entire story using only emoji and see if somebody else could read it. And like they're the, they discovered it, you know, a hundred years or a thousand years in the future. You should give like that my... task to your students. Yes. I feel like the children could do that. I also, the thing that I would be nervous about though, is the context. Cause like some emojis mean things that you don't think they mean. Yes, and I think the kids oh, have different true. meanings for yeah. some of them than we do. And some mean two yes. things. Like, they can mean horny, they can mean angry. I'm looking at you, red face with the tear. Is that really? Oh, yeah, that's uh, with the youth. It's uh, I'm like it's sort of a hot, <sighs> sweating for you kind of a thing. It could be yeah, feisty Zach's... or it could be... Uh... Yeah, Zach is the youngest one on the call, and he's nodding his head, so. Uh, <laughs> so you've opened my email. I think the next one is probably, like, click through it, right? Like, now I want you to click. So how do I get you to click? Um, yeah. Uh, so click through rate measures how many uh, people that opened your email actually clicked on the link for so your call to action. Um, so you need to make sure that your call to action is... Um, relevant and enticing um, something you know like hey click here to find out more information can be kind of boring but um, you just need to make it you know sound fun and exciting and like that on the other side of that click is some information or a discount or a freebie that you're really really been looking forward to mm. so tell um, me what you want me to do and make it yes. something that I want to do like and also yes. just like tell me what I'm going to get when I get there, and then on the conversion side, it's probably now deliver whatever that was. Like, don't mm -hmm. lie to me and bait and switch. Yes, mm. and the higher higher your click through rate means that the more uh, relevant your email content is and your click through or your call to actions are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so conversely, I... if you don't have a very high click-through rate, obviously you need to do some rethinking about your content and, and your calls to action. Or even placement. I think there's nothing, nothing more annoying to me than clicking on something and ending up in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yes. And still treat us search. Like, yes. Yeah. It's like, no, I need it to be force fed to me. <laughs> which is yeah, I, probably exactly a commentary on my where. attention span but <laughs> yeah if yeah. i click buy now you better be taking me to the thing i just saw in your email directly to, to the listing page yeah amazon ads are the worst like the wayfair ones where you're like oh that's a really cute whatever and you click on it and it just nope. takes you to their home page it's like i'm out lies i'm done I wanted mm -hmm. to see that thing. Because even if you like really want it and try to search for it half the time it's not even there or it's unavailable annoying Yes, um, your email design and your landing pages, they need to be very user-friendly. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Yep. <laughs> so there's a couple in this list that were new to me. I mean, they make sense when I look at them like, oh, yeah, but I'm like, oh, I haven't really thought about measuring those. So the two are, and we can tackle these separately, list growth rate. Um, half the time people's lists, I think, shrink because their unsubscribe rate is too high. But then the email mm -hmm. sharing and forwarding rate, which I hadn't ever thought of. I do forward mm -hmm. marketing emails occasionally, but let's talk list growth rate and then get into the email sharing and forwarding rate. Um, yeah, so. list growth rate is, I mean, how quickly you are growing your list. What rate At what rate your list is growing or shrinking. Um, and if you are actively looking for new subscribers while well, to you know mitigate the loss of those that unsubscribe. Um, typically, uh, you want to try to minimize those unsubscribes by doing all those things like we've been talking about the relevant content and subject lines and giving them what they want, basically. Um, and if that isn't what they're looking for, they're going to unsubscribe. And maybe you've been emailing them too many times. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Like, you also have to have new acquisition channels for gaining new subscribers. You need to have opt-in methods um, to make sure that you're, you know, properly collecting those unsubscribes and or not those unsubscribes i'm those, sorry the new subscribers mm-hmm. um to make sure that you have their permission to email them um so that you know they don't get, get angry and uh flag you as spam or report you <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a big misconception i think everybody by now knows like don't go buy a whole huge list of email addresses and throw them in there that's going to be a problem but not everybody gets... knows that do not okay, buy don't an email that, list. That's like, don't do that. You think there everybody le- knows, but not everybody knows. There are legit ways to source lists, but it always gets dicey, and your click throughs and conversions are usually mm-hmm. terrible with those because they didn't sign up directly with you. They signed up with a third party for generic marketing offers, offers blah, blah, blah. But the one mm-hmm. that gets me, though, is just because I buy something from you. Now, if I buy something from you, you have absolutely the right to send me emails about that purchase. Like mm-hmm. my receipt, yes. you can send me uh, a follow-up, you can send me a tracking number, you can ask me to review it. All of those things are transactional and related to my transaction. However, I did not automatically opt into all of your marketing just because I bought something from you. And I see Unless a lot of people. it's in that fine print that you didn't read when you made your purchase. <laughs> True, which it does happen. But I think a lot of times now I'm seeing right below um, the purchase in the cart, there's like a little checkbox. Like I'd mm-hmm. love to receive offers from you and discounts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think even that, you've got to have that text be enticing, like just offers and discounts. Okay, what am I signing up for? Am I signing up for a weekly like fire sale special? Am I signing up for new products? Uh, what's what am I what am I going to get? Otherwise, I'm going to be like <laughs> unsubscribe, or worse, I'll ghost you. I just yes, won't engage for a long time, <laughs> and then your email program will say you probably shouldn't email this person. They have it. Yeah, uh, yeah. To maintain your list, you need to be constantly. Um, working on growing it, you provide incentives, make sure you're optimizing all of your communications and retaining those subscribers that you currently have, uh, making sure that those emails are targeted and have personalized content and segment lists um, if you have multiple uh, audiences. So you just actually got me to one I was going to ask, but you got there first. So segmenting your list <laughs> and having different lists for different types of content that you're sending out or different audiences that you're reaching out to. So I may not get all 20 emails from you this month. I might only get four because I really only want that particular thing. Um, yes, a hundred percent. It reminds yeah, me of when Banana to... Republic and Gap. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, that's a hundred percent fine. I was just going to say that, yeah, you need to um, cater to like, to what they are looking for and what they, they want. If you have, you know, if you're looking for, um, I don't know, you're, like your tiki torches from Wayfair, but they're sending you um, mm-hmm. <laughs> bedding and mm-hmm. bath type of emails, then then you're like, nah, this isn't what I want. Yeah, it reminds me of when clothing companies, Gap and Banana Republic were the ones that I think of the most, used to just send the same email to everybody, men's clothes, women's clothes, and I'm like, hi, I'm mm-hmm. not buying, sk- I mean, I might buy skirts, but I have not indicated to you that I'm going to buy a skirt. <laughs> um, and then even some other ones where, like, I would get bra ads, and I'm like, um, gained a little weight, not ready for the makeup <laughs> yet, thanks. Um, but then they figured out like, oh, like if people are buying men's clothing, we should probably just send them men's clothing. And then some have even got so sophisticated to where you can opt out of like a Father's Day or a Mother's Day promo if like your parent passed away mm-hmm. or you've got bad blood or whatever, those kinds of things. So um, I think that as they get more like that, when people give me more options, I'm more likely to sign up because I can opt out of certain things or I know what I'm getting is relevant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's my biggest frustration and we see this all the time with like particularly on the HubSpot side with just like mismanagement or no management of contact information like when somebody makes a purchase from you you have or should in theory have a full history of that person's relationship with your business 
and optimizing on their purchase should not be rocket science. So like I buy similar things across brands, right? Mm -hmm. And they should all be like remarketing based on those things. And I know that my phone knows and my computer knows (laughs) and my location history knows, like pulling in all of that customer data. And, and this is one thing that Tyrell and I have talked about is that just like the closing of that loop is nearly impossible. He's like, I wish there was a button that I could click that says, I already bought this stop. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like the, the missed connection or missed opportunity in, in optimizing on purchase or on browsing history is pretty significant. And we find that even with our like B2B or really long sales process clients too, right? Like closing the loop and getting the purchase information is tantamount Mm -hmm. to maintaining a clean, good list. I talked, I just talked to one the other day about when somebody converts and becomes a customer you can set up a workflow to remove them from your prospecting lists. You can also put that in Mm -hmm. your, you know, drip campaign, you know, if they're, if they're Mm -hmm. marked as customer, do not send. The other thing you can do, if you hook your e-commerce to your CRM, if you're a B2C or B2B, you should be able to do dynamic content that would not show somebody Mm -hmm. products they purchased. Like you should be able to pull a five product or four product grid and tell it like, populate with anything in this category randomly except if they've purchased that before like Mm -hmm. i just i just think that if people can get more sophisticated like that it's going to work so much better for them Mm -hmm. that's what i want no i feel like that's a i mean to me like you can get into the real like nitty-gritty of things but optimizing your email marketing really just comes down to maintaining a clean database and um everything kind of goes back to that for me is like don't try and do all of these fancy tricks until you've yes. got good information good to clean send off. data yep and you don't want to you know get rid of those those subscribers that are no longer you know interacting with your, your exactly emails. they're not opening they're not clicking they're you know why send to them it's a waste of your time and money for that as well Mm-hmm. Unless you well, get something unique yeah. and different that you think might engage them, but you're right. Odds are, like they've opted out of you without opting out. They just have. Mm-hmm. Have you set on an automated delete this email when it arrives in my inbox? Yes. Oh, well, and you could do a re-engagement campaign. You can send out an mm-hmm. email saying, "Hey, are you still there? Are you still listening?" Kind of like um, right. Netflix does. Like, are you still watching? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I am. Please stop asking. Yes. So, you know, I have trying the to... Cheetos. And you can send them a list, say, hey, tell me, tell me what we're doing wrong. What are, what are you mm-hmm. interested in? And then please check these boxes um, of the things that you would like to hear about more so that we can provide you with more relevant content. Yeah, the other thing I've seen retail do is just increase the offer. Like if you're doing 10% off, I will ignore that every day. You're barely paying my sales tax. Oh, yeah. 15%, mm-hmm. like maybe if I want it. If you get it, but you've really got to get north of 20% before I'm interested. And the further north of 20% you get, the more interested I get. 50 is way better than 25, if you can afford yes. it and if your margins can. <laughs> but sometimes, like, they're a lost customer, right? So to win them back, you might need to do a 50%, especially if your product mix has changed or something, just to get them to mm-hmm. look. And they may also be like, no, forget it. I don't want this. But, you know, entice, entice, entice. Yep. I'm a big yeah. sucker for that 70% in the subject line. Oh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Also, when it doesn't say up to, because then you know there's one thing at 70%, everything else is 10% off. Exactly. And it's probably for, it's like a triple extra small or (laughs) something that would only fit a 10-year-old. Get you every time. (laughs) Yep. I also like the range. So everything is 50 to 70% off. So I know, okay, there's some at 70, Mm -hmm. but at least the least I'm going to get is half off. I'm mm-hmm. going to go look and see what they got because that sounds great to me. But that up to always just makes me like, just stop. Stop it, people. <laughs> stop putting one thing at a high discount and trying to make us think your whole store is on sale. It's not true. <laughs> and that, I guess that goes to relevance, right? And not lying to people yes. or being mm-hmm. shady. Yes, 100%.
All right. Well, I think we hit most stuff. We didn't really get into forwarding, but um, we'll save that for another time. Or, you know, maybe Charlotte will have a blog post on how to get your emails forwarded to other people, sure, uh, which is a way I to grow your that. list, right? Yes. Um, okay, Zach, she's on board for that blog post. You heard it here. Um, <laughs> all right. So the biggest thing I think that we took away is don't be shady. Uh, don't be shady. Mm-hmm. Don't be shady. Um, and then I think, Caitlin, your big one was gather the data and use the data to be relevant and send people snaps for using your data. Yes. yes. That's the email. If you're going to ask some, <laughs> yes. If you're going to ask somebody for their information, the, the least you can do is use it. I agree hundred percent. Well, thank you, Charlotte. This was, um, interesting. Like I did learn some things that I had never thought of. <laughs> like I said, like that list growth rate, like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Your list should be growing. And if that's a negative number, it's a problem, but I don't know very many people who put that on a dashboard. Like, and that's really critical because oh. yeah, hundred percent. I don't lose everybody. know that I've ever seen that on a dashboard, but that's something that you need to Isn't know. Wild? We're going to go right, at it to all clients. of our clients' dashboards now. I feel like that's a good idea. <laughs> Um, cool, cool. Uh, so next week, uh, we're going to have, or in two weeks, I guess, uh, we are going to try, try again, uh, with the little grasshopper that could, uh, mastering consistency brand versus social media identity with Megan. I think this is like our third time we've tried to record that, but schedules just keep conflicting. So bless Zach for continuing to put that on our calendar and trying to make it happen. Um, I'm excited about this one. In two weeks, I am excited to talk about the grasshopper because then I can talk about the grasshopper pie I had as a kid, which was basically mm-hmm. everything that's in the cocktail. Don't spoil it. Pie. Don't spoil it. Mm, I, now I want some so bad. Okay, Caitlin, <laughs> take us home. Uh, <laughs> you can find our agency at antidote underscore seven one on social. And if you have a question you'd like to send our way, you can head to CTA podcast dot live to send us an email. Or if you prefer a phone, you can leave us a voice message at 402-718-9971. And your question will almost definitely make it into a future episode. Honestly, if you just give us feedback and leave anything on that line that's relevant to the podcast, we'll put it in an episode. Zach is dying to pull a podcast like voice. I'm ready. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll call in. You can have my opportunity to utilize like a a give, voice changer use an accent give your husband two rum runners and then have him call in and tell us whether or two not wouldn't be enough business tips you're right i have uh, been out with him <laughs> it would take much like me it would take a few more but that's correct all right we'll see you next time <laughs>